This is the second in a series of two lectures on the doctrine of sin, and we're going to have to go along about 100 miles an hour to get this done, this tape. Uh, the first tape, the first lecture, uh, we discussed five of the 12 main divisions in our study here. And we're on Roman numeral six now, the consequences of sin. Uh, I think it was Art Linkletter a number of years ago that used to have a program entitled Truth or Consequences, and uh, they would ask certain questions, and if you couldn't tell the truth, you had to pay the consequences. Well, that's about what happened as far as Satan and as far as the first man was concerned. Uh, they erred concerning the truth, and they had to pay the consequences. What are the consequences of sin? Well, upon Lucifer, they are twofold. The immediate consequences, right after he sinned, he lost his coveted position as heaven's anointed cherub and became earth's depraved dragon. Now it is true, he still has access to the throne of God. In Revelation chapter uh, 12 we read that, but he is no longer a recipient of God's blessing. He is God's mortal enemy. So he lost his position. Uh, as the divine, uh, really uh, angelic uh, choir master in heaven. Now, his future consequences are even worse than the uh, immediate consequences. The devil himself, according to the Apostle Paul in Revelation, or in uh, Romans chapter 16, and uh, Jesus in Matthew 25, and, and John the Apostle mentions in Revelation 20, he will someday be forever cast into the lake of fire and uh, there to spend all eternity because of his sin. Well, what about the consequences upon man? When Adam opened the door for sin, he heard the knocking of the door in Genesis 3, and he let sin come in. But before he could get the door shut, sin brought in with him two vicious criminals, and these criminals immediately begin to torture and plague and torment the human race, and these gangsters are called physical death and spiritual death. And physical death, well, you see, that meant that Adam's spirit and soul would someday be separated from his body. And spiritual death is even worse than physical death. That's also separation brought in by sin, one of the consequences of sin. And that's eternal separation unless he responds to God's plan of salvation. Man will someday eternally be separated from God in the lake of fire. That's concerning the spiritual and physical consequences of man's sin. Well, sin had a terrible effect upon Lucifer, upon man, and upon Mother Nature. Because, you see, the Bible says that after sin, man's paradise became a wilderness. The roses now contain thorns. The docile tiger suddenly became a hungry meat-eater. And all of nature itself uh, began to suffer, as the book of Romans chapter 8 brings out. Now, this will continue to be the case right through the final day of the tribulation, until the curse is lifted uh, during the millennium. And again, in Romans 8, uh, we are told about this uh, glorious time uh, when the consequences of man's curse will be lifted from nature. All right, upon Lucifer, upon man, upon nature, upon the angels. Uh, what sin, what curse, or what judgment and uh, what were the consequences upon angels? Well, the fallen angels, of course, they had the same uh, consequences. They will suffer the same consequences as Lucifer suffered. Someday they too will spend all eternity in the lake of fire. But what about the holy angels, those who determined not to sin, those who did not follow Lucifer in his foul revolt against the king of the universe? Well, man's sin to these holy angels apparently became an object lesson 
for angels as God allowed them to enter into his blessed work of redeeming mankind. Now, by that I mean uh, in 1 Corinthians 4, now not that the angels themselves uh, entered into this redemption work by dying for man, but they were involved in it as spectators. And they're very interesting uh, in the work of the uh, salvation. In 1 Peter 1.12, Peter says, Which things, and he's talking about salvation here, the angels desire to look into. He's talking about the holy angels here. And uh, in Hebrews 1.14, uh, the Apostle Paul said, Are they, angels, not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be the heirs of salvation? So as far as the holy angels are concerned, man's sin that prompted God's grace then became an object lesson that the angels could now know something more about their Creator that they could not have known had man not sinned. So God works the wrath of men for his glory and for the education of his holy angels. Now the consequences of man are consequences of sin upon Lucifer, upon man, upon nature, upon the holy angels, and what were the consequences of man's sin upon God himself? Well, it meant that God could no longer rest as he had once done when creation was completed. In Genesis 2, we read of God resting, and we never read of God resting again after that. But it meant that after man's sin, God then began his second and most important work. God has performed two great works, that of creation he finished that, though. He's not creating anything today. The first and second laws of thermodynamics would bear that out, not only from the Scripture but from the, uh, the physical world. Uh, but he began his second work, and that was, of course, the work of redemption. To this very day, because of man's sin, God continues to work in matters of redemption. Uh, Jesus, while he was on earth, mentioned that. He said, My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. And he tells his disciples, I must work the works of him that sent me. And Paul assures his Philippian readers, He which hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. Now, Roman number 7, what about the imputation of sin? We've already, some time ago, uh, made the tapes concerning the doctrine of man, and we looked at the various methods of and theories of imputation, and we need not spend much time on that here. But uh, how did man get his sin nature? I have a sin nature. Where did I get my sin nature from? Or we could ask the question this way. What are, were the effects of Adam's fall merely confined to himself? And or do they somehow continue to make themselves known in the lives of 20th century men? There are four positions here concerning the imputation. Remember that word? We studied that when we were looking at the great doctrines of salvation, the, great, the vocabulary of salvation. To impute means to add something to someone's account. And um, the liberal position would deny this. And it says in Genesis uh, 3, man's sin was a simply a silly Hebrew legend, and there can, of course, be absolutely no effect whatsoever upon me today. I sin today, there's no doubt about it, the liberals would admit that, but I didn't get it, or Adam wasn't responsible because he never lived. That's what the liberals would say. Then there's a uh, position... Uh, developed by a British monk who, whose name was Pelagius. And Pelagius says that Adam's sin affected only himself. Adam did live, but his sin affected only himself. For God imputes to men only those sins which they personally and consciously perform. And so the only effect of Adam's sin upon posterity and upon me was a bad example. Well, that was, of course... Uh, that's totally condemned by the Bible. 
Then there is the Armenian position uh, developed by Arminius, uh, a Holland professor, and he says that uh, Adam's sin definitely weakened my will to live a righteous life. However, it did not prevent me from living a righteous life. It simply weakened my will. And that theory is wrong. And then the theory that definitely is supported by the Bible is a theory known as the Augustinian position, and that says that because of the unity of the human race in Adam, his sin therefore is imputed by or to his posterity. And thus, Augustine said, corrupt nature begets corrupt nature. And this view, of course, is supported many passages. We think of Romans 5.12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Therefore, Paul says in verse 18, As by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. And uh, you'll have now uh, in your notes two uh, extensive quotation, one by Louis Burkhoff and the other by J. Oliver Buswell, uh, on the imputation, the Augustinian, or sometimes called the federal, theory and position of imputed sin. And we encourage you and urge you to read these two statements. Well, again, let's see where we are. The definition of sin, the origin of sin, the nature, the universality, the exceeding sinfulness of sin, the consequences of sin, the imputation of sin now, the various kinds of sin. Are there some sins worse than others? Now, James, of course, in chapter 2, verse 10, does teach uh, that uh, if one be guilty of one sin, he's broken the entire uh, chain, as it were. Uh, but uh, there are are also scripture passages that indicate, in fact strongly uh, state, that there are some sins greater uh, than other sins, more heinous than other sins. Uh, Jesus states this in Luke 12. He says, And that servant, I think he's referring to Israel here now, who knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whom, whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required. And, uh, of course, Paul would say that uh, they that uh, have sinned uh, under the law shall perish, be judged by the law, and they that have sinned without the law shall be judged apart from the law. So there are certainly uh, different kinds of sin. However, uh, we do not uh, accept the Roman Catholic method of categorizing uh, certain sins into mortal and venial sins. And the mortal sins, uh, like leaving the Roman Catholic Church, will send you to hell forever. And then venial sins, these are less serious sins, and uh, you can uh, get to uh, heaven or at least uh, some type of uh, paradise after suffering in purgatory for a while. But we're not talking about that kind of classification. Uh, but uh, with these clarifications in mind, I think we can consider uh, some of the various kinds of sin, uh, sins as indicated in the Word of God. There are sins of ignorance. Um, chapter, uh, Luke uh, chapter 23, uh, the first statement that Jesus makes on the cross. He said, Forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, they knew they were doing wrong, but they probably didn't fully realize just how wrong they were and the enormity of the crime that they were committing. They were crucifying the one who had originally created the very ground that they were standing upon. And I think that's what he meant by that. And uh, so there are sins of ignorance. Then there are sins of infirmity. 
Uh, David says, uh, Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Uh, David also said in Psalm 103, He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities, for he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. I think it's possible for me to allow uh, my uh, worry machine, as it were, that we all seem to carry around with us, uh, just to... Uh, to become uh, overtaxed and have a nervous breakdown. And that's sin, because we're not trusting God. Uh, but maybe that's due to our infirmities. Maybe we're not taking care of ourselves. And, and I found that uh, my uh, stomach and my soul are closely connected. And if I overeat and I get sluggish uh, uh, physically, I uh, doubtless then become sluggish spiritually. Well, that's sin, but it's not quite as bad as as the sin of uh, uh, maybe uh, deliberate uh, murder, uh, yet it is a sin of infirmity, uh, sins of uh, allowing uh, the flesh to uh, perhaps uh, become uh, out of whack, so to speak. And then there are sins of carelessness. David mentioned this. He said, I said, I will take heed to my ways that I sin not with my tongue. Uh, sins of carelessness, of Sometimes we are stopped. Uh, we've all, I suppose, well, I have several times in the uh, some 30 years that I've been driving a car. I've been stopped three times, I think. I guess that's not too bad, but uh, really I didn't have an excuse those three times. But all three times it was careless. And I, I saw the speed limit, just didn't deliberately disobey it, but, but I did disobey it. I uh, careless and didn't think about it, and I was arrested. And, Twice I was let go, and one time I had to pay a fine, and rightly so. Uh, so uh, there are sins of carelessness. Then there are sins of presumption. These are, these are horrible sins. Uh, I think a sin of presumption is uh, when we unlawfully assume something to be so. To presume is to assume that, well, I just presumed that thus and such. Well, you didn't have a right to do that. And that's unlawfully assuming something to be so. And in this case, the unlawful thing is that God will not or cannot or maybe better not deal with me after my sinful actions. Sometimes we go ahead and do things and we sort of dare God or dare somebody else, even though we know they're wrong, uh, to chastise us. And uh, uh, the Bible says that we need to really beware of this. Again, the psalmist prayed, Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. And God knows I have enough careless sins and sins of infirmity, but these presumptuous sins, these are very bad. All right, and then what about the unpardonable sin? Uh, again, to make a long story short, in Matthew 12, I believe the sin, I'll read that passage, Jesus said, Wherefore I say unto you, All manner of sin and blasphemy, shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. What is the unpardonable sin? Of course, there are two theories. One is that you can sin away your day of grace, and once you cross the line, there's no way to be saved. You can plead and beg, and, but you can't be saved. And I think that's totally unscriptural, because if you say that, then you refute. Uh, the book of Romans, for example, where Paul says, Where sin did abound, there did grace much more abound. What does it mean? And uh, my uh, conclusion is this, that this sin mentioned here was dispensational. That means it was, it was locked in as far as a period of time was concerned, that it was the sin that the Pharisees committed 2,000 years ago of ascribing to Satan the earthly miracles performed by our Savior and therefore can be committed today. Uh, I say that because uh, Jesus is not uh, going around uh, raising dead people today. Now, some faith healers say that he is, but uh, we know that that's a lie, that he's not, and that he's not uh, walking around, uh, walking on the water and feeding the thousands. and. You see, he did those things on one occasion, though, and uh, 
the Pharisees saw it and they couldn't deny it. And they said, well, yeah, but he's doing this. He's doing it all right. It's a miracle, no doubt about that, but he's doing it through the power of the devil. Well, there's no one that can say that today because Jesus isn't doing these things and therefore that sin cannot be committed. But here's a sin that can be and often is, I believe, committed. Perhaps eternity will only realize, will only d display rather and reveal how many times this uh, final sin that we're talking about now has been committed, and that is the sin unto death. Only a believer can commit that. Uh, Paul or John says in 1 John 5, there is a sin unto death. What is this sin? Uh, well, the common accepted view, as I say, is that this sin can only be committed by a child of God, and it happens whenever the believer down here lives such a wretched life that the Father finally reaches down and takes him home to heaven earlier than he normally would have. I think Ananias and Sapphira are guilty, were guilty of perhaps the first two to commit that sin. Well, Wilmington, how do you know they were even saved? One little word tells me in the book of Acts. Remember when they lied? Uh, the apostle Peter confronted them with it, and he says, Ananias, why hath uh, Satan tempted thee to lie to the Holy Spirit? Now, the little word why tells us they were saved. How does that tell us? Well. Uh, you don't say to an unsaved person uh, who uh, you might see coming out of a tavern, why have you come out of this tavern? You wouldn't say that to him uh, because uh, you just expect him if he's unsaved to drink perhaps. But if you saw a Christian, if you saw Jerry Falwell or Billy Graham or uh, perhaps your teacher, uh, I'm not even classifying myself with those two men, but I mean any any uh, Christian that you might have some respect for, you saw him come out of a tavern, you'd, you'd very uh, naturally say, why? Because you don't expect them to do that. They're saved. Well, Peter didn't expect them to lie. He said, why have you done that? And I believe that they were guilty of committing the sin unto death. So I'm not at all concerned about the unpardonable sin, but I tell you, as a child of God, I am and should be, and you better be, concerned about the sin unto death. Then Roman numeral 9, the metaphors of sin. Uh, the Holy Spirit is ascribed by oil and wine and wind, and, and, and the lepers or uh, sin is also described by, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Israel is described, I should say, by uh, terms of the fig tree and the, and the olive branch and, and uh, the, uh, the vineyard. But uh, there are metaphors for sin also. Uh, sin is poisonous, like a viper. It's stubborn, like a mule. It's cruel, like a bear. You can read these passages here that we have for you. It's destructive, like a canker worm. It's unclean, like a wild dog. It's cunning, like a fox. It's fierce, like a wolf. It devours, like a lion. And it's filthy, like a swine. The metaphors of sin. Now, what happens when a Christian sins? And this is Roman numeral 10. The Christian's sin. I remember, of course, my salvation experience. And right after I was saved and, and enjoyed the full assurance of the new birth, I was so happy and I thought, now I'll never have to worry about sinning again. Now, I really didn't go to a church where they taught that. I went to a Baptist church, a Southern Baptist church, but I don't know why I sort of got that idea that once saved, uh, that you would uh, stop sinning. I never have to worry about lusting, never have to worry about cursing, never have to worry about evil thoughts, never have to worry about going back to smoking again and all these other things. And someone has said, I wasn't saved 20 minutes until I was gloriously disappointed. <laughs> For I found that uh, I still have the old nature. Well, now, what about my sin? Well, I didn't know about my sin in those days. I thought maybe I need to be saved again, and I came forward four different times after I got saved. Nobody really dealt with me. And I, and I thought, well, I, I, I'm saved, and yet I've sinned, and I, I must have lost my salvation. Uh, well, what about this? What happens when the Christian fails to use this available power and he falls into sin. How does God view sin in the life of his child? 
Is it indeed possible, as some have claimed, to remain sinless from the cross to the crown? And uh, we've used Dr. Ryrie's uh, outline here. Uh, he says, the fact of sin, the effect of sin, the preventives against sin, and the remedy for sin. And in the fact of sin, he brings, of course, uh, uh, chapter uh, 1 in the first epistle of John, verses 8 to 10, uh, of those who deny the presence of sin or the particulars of sin or the personality or the personal sin. And he said, that's all wrong because believers sin. And he said, John says, if we say, he's talking to Christians now, that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. I remember uh, so many years ago hearing a preacher give a testimony in Pacific Garden Missions in Chicago, Illinois. And he said, I was saved 30 years ago. And he said, uh, 29 years ago, a year after I was saved, he said, I was sanctified. And I remember him saying, he said, and the old man in me died like a yaller dog on the back porch. Well, I was just a boy of 18 at that time and when I heard that, and I've often wondered the sense, uh, and I wondered at the time, wonder how a yaller dog dies on the back porch. Uh, do they die different on a back porch as they do on the front porch? And does a yaller dog die differently from a, from a black dog? Well, uh, the point of his testimony is that uh, for 29 years he had not sinned. Of course, uh, today I would say, uh, I'd like to talk to your wife about that, sir, and, and are from the one that knows you the best. Uh, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Well, that's the fact. We're going to sin. We shouldn't, but we're going to. Now, what about the effect of sin? The child of God immediately loses at least six things when he sins. He loses the loss of light. You're walking along and suddenly... The light goes out, uh, your flashlight fails, or the car lights fail. It's a terrible situation. And uh, sin causes us to lose the loss of light and the inability to know God's will and God's way. And then the loss of joy. Remember David prayed after he had sinned, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. There's nothing more miserable than a child of God out of the will of God. The loss of joy, the loss of peace. And, uh, uh, you know, there are two kinds of peace in the Bible. There's a peace with God, and all believers have that. But there's a peace of God, and only believers that are cleansed from sin uh, through daily uh, walking in the light have that peace. And not all believers have the peace of God. Some of the most frustrated people on earth are believers that have the peace with God but do not have the peace of God. They've lost it because of sin. And then the loss of love. Uh, the loss of love for the Savior, for the saints, for the scriptures, and for sinners. Uh, that's usually the way it happens when a person sins, the loss of love, the loss of fellowship. He can't, she can't really sing. What a fellowship, what a joy divine because of sin. And then the loss of confidence in preaching, teaching, witnessing, doing anything for God, even during the our own jobs because of a guilty conscience, a loss of confidence, and then the possible loss if the sin continues and is severe enough of health, 1 Corinthians 11, Paul says, or of physical life. Paul says, for this cause, the sin that they had committed at the, at the Lord's table, many are sickly among you and many sleep. So the effects are tragic, at least seven of them here. Now what about the preventatives against sin? Although we cannot be sinless, we certainly can sin less. How do we do that? Well, there are three things that keep us from sinning if we'll just obey them. The Word of God and the intercession of the Son of God and the ministry of the Spirit of God. I hear, hear the word of God, number one. That's so important. Psalm 119, Paul say, or, uh, David says, Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. And Jesus said in John 15, Now you are clean through the word, 
And in uh, chapter 17, verse 17, he prays to the Father to sanctify them through thy truth. Then he says, thy word is truth. So uh, the word of God. It's been observed, of course, that the Bible will keep me from sinning, or sinning will keep me from the Bible. And then the intercession, the ministry of the Son of God. Remember he told, Jesus told Peter in Luke 22, Satan has desired to have you that he might sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for thee, you see. And then the ministry, of course, of the Spirit of God. Zechariah 4, 6, not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit. The ministry of the Son of God, of the Word of God, of the Spirit of God. What about the remedy for sin? In spite of the fact that there are preventatives against it, let us suppose that uh, we still sin. Well, Schaefer has a very, I think, uh, adequate description here uh, of how a believer gets back into right relationship with God, and it's by that one word, confess. You see, in 1 John 1, 9, Jesus, or John says, If we confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That word confess simply means to agree with. That's what it means. Here a criminal's arrested. Uh, he's caught and he confesses to the crime. And what happens is this. They the detective says that you were seen leaving, this jewelry store was robbed the other day, you were seen leaving that jewelry store. Later on, you were captured, and uh, some of the loot, the stolen loot, was on your person. And uh, we have checked the door of that jewelry store, and uh, it bears your fingerprints. You are guilty. And the criminal says, I confess. That means he's saying, I agree with what you say. Now here a child of God does things he should not do. The Spirit of God puts the finger on him, arrests him, as it were, and says, now listen, this is what you've done thus and such. And when the child of God says, I agree, what you say is true, I won't do that again. You see, now that's the remedy for sin. We confess our sin. And it has been said that the blood of Christ will forgive us of all of our sins, but not one of our excuses. So to be forgiven is to confess. And in a sense, according to this verse, we don't even have to ask God to forgive us. Now, I'm sure that's involved. But I used to, when I'd sin, I'd be so sorry, but I, I would beg God and plead with him and just hope that I could get through to him. I didn't have to do that. All I need to do needed to have done and need to do today is when the Spirit of God rebukes me for this is to say, Lord, you've convicted me of that statement or that action or that thought. And I agree it was wrong. I had no business doing it. And I appreciate the fact of you calling it to my attention. And then just go right on as if God has forgiven you because he has. You see, if we confess our sins, agree with what God has said about our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All right, now, Roman numeral 11, the reasons for our sin. I think there are two reasons here, and again, probably one of the uh, unanswerable questions, and there are a number, but I can't think of... Uh, of a more profound, unanswered question in the Word of God than why did God allow sin in the first place? Very frankly, if I were God, I would not have allowed an Adolf Hitler to grow up. I would have somehow made sure that he either, number one, was not born or secondly, died in infancy. Had God allowed him to die in infancy, by the way, he could have taken him to heaven, couldn't he? But he allowed him to grow up and become the greatest, the most notorious sinner of his day. Why did God allow sin? Of course, we do not know. We just have two 
suggested answers here. Here is the first one. God created both angels and men as intelligent creatures possessing moral natures which could determine and choose between right and wrong. Had God stopped Lucifer and Adam one second before their sin, he would have, in effect, violated their own moral natures and reduced them to mere walking robots. Now, the difference between an angel and a man and an animal, apparently, is this moral nature. You see, a dog, as far as we know, is not immoral or moral. A dog is amoral. A dog has no morals. Now, a vicious dog may be, uh, may be uh, a very harmful and dangerous to man, but he's not immoral because he can't go against the revealed will of God, you see. And that's where morality comes in. Uh, but uh, had God stopped Adam or stopped Lucifer, uh, then he would have reduced them to robots and animals instead of men and angels as they really were. That may be one suggested answer, a part of the answer, why God allowed sin, because he could not treat these two intelligent creatures by stopping them from their sin and still being true to his own intentions in the first place of creating them as moral agents. The second reason, God allowed men or man to sin, it has been suggested, that he might display his grace. In other words, prior to Adam, God was already exhibiting his omnipresence and being ever at once, his omnipotence in setting the galaxies in motion, his omniscience in creating angels, and I think his wrath in judging angels, his holiness in condemning Satan for his sin. But there was one attribute, one characteristic, perhaps closer to his heart than any other and that was his grace. And God was not having the opportunity to express that. You see, because where there is no sin, of course there was sin in Lucifer's case, but Lucifer couldn't be saved, there would be no need of grace. And uh, I think Paul brings this out. He said, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Why then did God allow men to sin? Well, no one knows. But it doesn't seem unreasonable to believe that a part of the answer lies in the above suggestion, that is, to display his marvelous grace. We do know that this grace will be displayed throughout eternity because in Ephesians 2 we read, um, uh, Even when we were dead in sins, he hath quickened us together with Christ, for by grace are you saved, that in the ages to come, that's to all eternity, he might show the exceeding richness of his grace and his kindness toward us through Jesus Christ. Roman numeral 12, the ultimate and final victory over sin. And here we have quoted for you uh, four passages, 1 Corinthians 15 and 2 Peter chapter 3 and Hebrews 12 and Revelation chapter 20. Uh, I like uh, especially uh, 2 Peter 3. Uh, Peter says, But the heaven and earth, which are now by the same word, he's talking about the flood that once condemned uh, the first world, and now the second world, will, this new world will be, I mean the world we exist on today will be condemned by fire. Uh, the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved into fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. The beloved, be not ignorant of this thing, one thing that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us, were not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord shall come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up, 
seeing then that all these things, including man's sin, you see, shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Now, that is Roman numeral 12 the ultimate and final victory over sin. Paul had once asked, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The greatest thing about the Bible, I think, is that it has a happy ending. I like stories that have happy endings, don't you? I think of the words as we see all the sin and evil about us today, I think of the words of the poet Henry Longfellow, who wrote a song, and this has been put to music, entitled, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day. And sometimes I am tempted to take the philosophy of Longfellow when he wrote the song, at least the first two stanzas, and uh, especially Christmas time, and we hear songs about peace on earth and righteousness, and yet we listen to the television uh, announcements and the news cast, and, and we're constantly hearing reports of increase in rape and murders and felonies and hijacking and, and brutal murders, and we're tempted to say in regards to the sin problem. As Longfellow once said, I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play, and wild and sweet the words repeat of peace on earth, good will to men. But in despair I bowed my head, there is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, good will toward men. Then peal the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail. With peace on earth, good will toward men. Till ringing, singing on its way, the world revolved from night to day. A voice, a chime, a chant sublime of peace on earth, goodwill to men. This completes Lecture 1B of the Doctrine of Sin. You may now take your midterm exam. This will be found in the exam packet marked Midterm E1.